comenzar. ¿Estamos listos? ¿Sí? Perfecto. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome so much to this event. It's wonderful that you have joined us for this wonderful fireside chat. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Rosa Salorio, and I actually serve as Associate Dean for International Comparative Legal Studies at UW Law School. And our event today will discuss um, important aspects and issues related to the field of investor state arbitration, but from the arbitrator's perspective is actually the first event that we have, you know, which actually features, you know, this perspective as opposed to the attorney perspective in investor uh, state arbitrations. And I just want to say that this event is part of our international arbitration speaker series. And we also have an LLM concentration right now at GW Law School uh, devoted to international arbitration mediation and other forms of dispute resolution and it's wonderful to see some of the students that are pursuing and completing that arbitration um, concentration uh, connected today and I feel very honored actually by the speakers and the professors that join us for this wonderful discussion. Um, I first want to introduce Professor Juan Fernandez Armesto and Professor Fernandez Armesto is a professional arbitrator, founder of Armesto and Asociados, uh, which is a law firm of professional arbitrators. And since 2001, uh, Professor Fernandez Armesto has acted as sole arbitrator, co-arbitrator or chairman in more than 180 proceedings. But I hear that it's actually more than 200 um, as well, and including investment, commercial, and construction arbitrations. He has also been the president of the Spanish Securities and Exchange Commission, a partner of Uria Menendez, and chaired professor of commercial law. And it's always a pleasure to introduce Professor Rafael Cox Alomar, who joins us today. Um, he's a professor at UDC Law School. And prior to joining the law faculty at UDC, Professor Cox Alomar practiced law in some of the most prestigious international law firms in Washington, DC, acting on behalf of clients on a wide array of dispute resolution and transactional matters. And more specifically, he has acted as counsel on eight international arbitrations before uh, the World Bank's Inter International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes. And it's wonderful to see some of the members of EXIT here today, uh, representing, among others, Venezuela, Chile, Philippines, and Electricité de France. And he's also a visiting scholar at GW Law School, and he comes from that wonderful island, Puerto Rico as well, which is great. <laughs> We're very proud of him in Puerto Rico. Uh, thank you both for joining us today and for your time today. I also wanna thank the International Law Society and the International Arbitration Student Association for co-sponsoring this event as well. And without further ado, I give the floor to Professor Cox Alomar who will moderate our discussion today. Thank you so much to the speakers for being here, for being willing to share your wisdom and knowledge with all of us today. And thank you to those of you that have joined this discussion today. In Celorio, thank you so much for the invitation. As a, and as you have mentioned, today we have the distinct honor of having amongst us one of the more renowned investor state arbitrators around the globe right now, who is uh, Juan Fernandez Armesto. So, Professor Fernandez Armesto, it's a pleasure having you here. And let's just get this conversation started. And I guess the first question we have is, how did you become an international arbitrator? Uh, that's a, well, first of all, it's a pleasure being here with uh, Dean Thelorio and with uh, Professor Cox Alomar. They are both, let me tell all of you from Puerto Rico. And of course, Puerto Rico was, was the jewel of Spain. Eh? It was the jewel of Spain. La, a Perla de las Antillas, it was uh, one of the most uh, cherished uh, uh, parts of Spain. And I think it is still, uh, among all uh, Latin American uh, countries, it's still the one which is closest to our hearts. Um, so it's a pleasure being here with you. Um, how did I become an arbitrator? Um, I, I'll, I'll uh, very briefly, I went, uh, to become chairman of the Spanish Securities Commission. My former life was basically banking and securities law. So I was uh, a partner at, at the firm. I taught uh, at a university in Madrid, uh, commercial and banking law. And 
when I left um, the Securities Commission, so that was back many, many years back, 20 years back, I said, what shall I do? And somehow I said, I'm mm, going back to, to being a lawyer in the securities area when, when you have with the, the chairman. Well, it didn't look very appetizing. And I said, mm. I had done one or two arbitrations before. And I said, mm, there should be room for someone who is independent and who just works as an arbitrator. So I set up shop and said, I, um, I had a flat in Madrid and I had a secretary and a um, couple of books and a pen and some papers. And I said, I will uh, become an arbitrator. And um, let me also tell you, there was, this is important if you want to become an arbitrator. I was still being paid a little, a part of my salary for two years, because uh, that's the way you, when, when you leave office so that you don't go immediately back into private practice, you still have some, a little bit of income for two years. So I had a little bit of income and I said, I will see if I can survive as an arbitrator. And it proved really very tough going. Um, I, I remember that I think in 2002, I had two cases, two very small cases. Um, I think in 2003, it already were three cases. I still had six months between one case and the next. So I did a lot of studying. I went to bookshops. Um, I, I had a... It was some of the very best years of my life. And then slowly, very slowly, um, things picked up. And so I think the fourth year I had six cases and then slowly it evolved. And it evolved in a strange, unexpected way because somehow the market pushed me into cases with states. Maybe because I had an experience with the state and then experience in private practice, so I ended up doing cases with uh, states. And then I did something, I, I hate to be alone. And so um, 2004 or something, um, a young lawyer uh, wrote, uh, saying she came from the same German school as I came. She had done the same, she had a, a degree in law and then economics, and she had just finished. And she said, could I do some internship with you? And she started, and now 20 years later, 15 years later, she is my partner, and um, we now have, we are now three partners. We have a small firm of uh, between uh, six and eight uh, uh, um, uh, clerks. And what the only thing we do, and that is, I think, quite unique in the world, is we just sit as arbitrators. We don't do anything else. We don't write opinions. We don't uh, research, we don't, uh, we just sit modestly as arbitrators if the parties want to appoint us. That's the story, Rafael. That's a very exciting story and, and a very unusual story. Um, and I have a follow up question here, which is in terms of your appointments as an arbitrator, are you usually approached by the arbitral institutions themselves or by the councils or the parties? How do you usually get your designations? Let, let, let me tell you. Um, uh, when I started, I did the following. I went to visit uh, all lawyers I could think about uh, in various places in the world, which, whom I had somehow met in former lives, to tell them, look here, I have taken this uh, plunge and I, I am now sitting as an arbitrator and waiting for mandates in Madrid in Spain. So I came to Washington, I went to New York, I went then to South America, I went to Paris, I put in also some a little bit of holidays in and I visited. So I told people that I was there. It's a very soft uh, uh, sell. It's, I always sell, say it's similar, you know, in the, at the beginning of the 20th century in the Belle Epoque, 
when you had or in the in the deep south you had these big uh, balls uh, where young girls went to the ball and they sat in a corner on a chair and of course they wanted to be that that young young men come and take them out to dance huh? but it's not uh, proper that you somehow induce the man uh, 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 to pick you up and to take you to dance it's exactly the same in, as an arbitrator, you want to be designated, but as a, as a young, young debutante, you cannot say, look, I am very pretty, uh, I am very nice, uh, I am no, I'm very pleasant. No, it's the same with an arbitrator. You can't tell uh, a, a lawyer, um, look here, I am very impartial, or I am very independent, um, I will do justice. Um, it's, it's something, it, so I just went to, to, to and told my story. I went also to the three or four institutions, ICSID. I, I, uh, I went to ICSID in, in, in Washington. I went to the ICC, to the LCIA and said, here I am. And so I, at the beginning, what happens is people give you small mandates. Huh? Uh, you know, the, I remember my first my first case, I will never forget it, was some cranes in, in Lisbon in the garbage burning utility in, um, in Lisbon. And I had to go and to look, it's a huge uh, uh, place full of garbage and cranes were fluffing, uh, dreadful smell. Uh. And so that was my, whether these cranes were working properly or not. And I looked at the cranes, made a, a, a decision on that. And uh, so you start with very small cases. And uh, if people then have more uh, trust in you, they, they have more, they get to know you, they get to know your decisions. Well, it's word of mouth. You slowly, it's like an oil, uh, 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 oil which expands and people then tend to know you and uh, to trust you. Um, that's that's how you become an arbitrator. Professor, Word of mouth. Professor, do you participate more often in investor state arbitrations or commercial arbitrations and do you prefer one over the other? Let me tell you, I, I am a, I come from commercial law. So what I studied, what I taught, what I wrote about is commercial law. So contracts is, is my, it's the blood in my professional career. Commercial arbitrations are the ones I really like because, um, well, it is closest to my experience, to my heart. They are also less political, less uh, complex. Um, uh, uh, it is all about uh, business relationships. I, I also like very much construction huh? because construction is for lawyers is fascinating. Huh? Each project is different. Huh? How do you build a dam? How do you build a power station? Um, uh, uh, why did this go wrong? Why was there a delay? I, I find that's just challenging. So I like construction cases. No? I, I had a case of a huge bridge over a canal. Uh, well, it, it's, it, 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 it is a challenge to understand the technical aspects. But then I was more and more pushed into investment arbitration maybe because of my background. And I, of course, I like investment arbitration. Let me tell you, um, the awards are very, very long. Um, they are now becoming like Russian novels. Uh, they, they are now 200, 300 pages long. Um, there are all sorts of uh, uh, legal procedural complexities which you must address. Um, and there is, of course, Every time you have a state, uh, there is public interest uh, uh, is, is at work. Uh, so there, when there is public interest, the, the, another way of calling that is political interest. There is a political side. Uh, and that gives additional difficulty uh, to investment arbitration. You must balance 
the right, and, and the states always tell you, if you award in favor of the investor, this will be paid by every single citizen. And sometimes they make you, every citizen will put $600 out of his own pocket to pay for this uh, compensation, which is requested by the claimants. There is this social political element, which you must counterbalance with the rights of the investor, who has also made an investment and has some expectations. Um, it's, it is much more difficult, much more soul searching, much more difficult to decide an investment case. I have no doubt about that. Professor, bearing in mind your background was commercial law, did you have any background in public international law when you began hearing investor state arbitrations? None. I am, uh, and I don't know if it is an, an advantage or a disadvantage. I suppose it's a, a huge disadvantage. I had none. Eh? I had uh, no experience in international law. Um, I came from private uh, 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 commercial law. Um, and uh, yes, it took me some time to learn about it. And um, there was a learning curve. There was a learning curve. The first times I was confronted, I will uh, not uh, hide from your students and from you that I was baffled. Huh? But some of the issues of international law, um, it took me decades until I think I understand now what customary international law is and how international law works. Um, and some in... Uh, most favored nation clauses, uh, for example, uh, umbrella clauses. I mean, there are some nice uh, touches of international law, which, um, which take some time to understand, if at all, uh, if, the, if, if you ever understand them. Professor, in looking at some of your more recent awards, some of your more recent designations, it seems as if for the last few years, you have acted quite heavily as president of the tribunal, as opposed to co-arbitrator. Could you actually explain to us the distinctions when one is acting as president of the tribunal in terms of your responsibilities and we're, when you're acting as a co-arbitrator and which one do you prefer? Mm. <laughs> yes, I am uh, I'm now, I think, almost exclusively acting as president. Um, it just proves one thing, that, and that is that I'm getting old, huh? because there is a certain correlation between getting old and becoming president. Um, the president, in the practice, what happens is the president is the one who drafts, uh, Rafael. So you have all the work on your shoulders. And especially in these investment arbitrations, it is really huge work. Uh, um, it takes two, three months of your life uh, to draft an investment arbitration because it takes a lot of time to read. There are now hundreds of pages, thousands of documents. You have to read through that. Lawyers do not always tell you the truth. Uh, um, so you have to really double check everything which counsel tells you. <laughs> and very often when you go to the documents, you will find that the documents don't say that what the counsel wants them to say. You have sometimes shocks on the differences. They expect that you will not look at the documents, but when you do, it is fundamental. So it takes a lot, a lot of time. And... You must like, you must like drafting. It's a bit, I say, it's a bit like a novelist. You start every morning before a sheet of paper or before your computer and you continue drafting and you are trying to, uh, to, to draft, uh, to write a war and peace uh, and you are still in page 22 and you say, my goodness, I still have all that to go through and you must keep going at every day, writing five, six, seven pages, 
Uh, then going back, because sometimes uh, what you have written before now doesn't uh, strike you as true. So it's a huge effort. Yeah? It's a huge effort. If, if between you and me, uh, and, uh, as, as a secret, or only for you, Rafael, it, it, is, <laughs> much <laughs> better paid, uh, it is much better paid to be co-arbitrator than to be president. Uh, the normal split is uh, 40% for the uh, 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 chairman and 30% uh, for each co-arbitrator. Since the bulk of the work is on the shoulders of the uh, chairman, uh, believe me, eh? if uh, it, it is better paid to be a co-arbitrator. And um, it's, a, it's a different role. Eh? It is you, you debate, you propose, but you don't draft. Eh? The drafting is done by the president. Professor, um, if you could take us to the to the inside of the deliberation process. I mean, while you are pretending you are Leo Tolstoy writing War and Peace, do you call your fellow co-arbitrators or do you share pieces as you go along drafting? I mean, what's the dynamic? What's the interaction um, between that president of the tribunal and his or her co-arbitrators while the president is drafting and, and producing the award? What's going on there? Let me let me tell you. Um, one of the things which surprise a lot of people is that when uh, you have first written submissions and then you have a hearing. Let, let me tell that to to students. And the hearing, you hear the the lawyers make oral presentations, and then you have witnesses, and then you have experts. Normally, in the course of the hearing normally, but not always, you, you start having a certain thought about what where justice lies. And what I like is that after the hearing, a hearing typically takes between five days, uh, in a small case, say it takes two, three days. In a normal case, it takes five, six days. In big cases, it can take two, three weeks. And after the hearing, I like to meet, to deliberate with the other co-arbitrators because you have everything fresh, everyone has his ideas and you make some notes and you make some notes, some issues will be clear and all of you, we all agree that this and this, or we have jurisdiction, we don't. There will be some issues, huh? Uh, on which you do not agree or which are still unclear. So I have here um, a, a, a rule. Eh? When you are unclear about something, write it. When you write, first of all, you look at the documents. So they are fresh, they give you insight. And there is somehow, when you write, even if it's in a computer, when you type into the computer and look at the document, there is an element that you go through uh, your mind and you normally, well, you must then make up your mind. Eh? You, you summarize the position of one party. You summarize the position of the other party. You look at the document. You read again the law. And at some stage, you come to a conclusion. So, once you have written uh, uh, and you have reached a conclusion, you have another deliberation with the, with the tribunal. If the, there may be still questions which are where, where you where you are answered, but most of the questions will now be solved. So you have a second round of deliberation. At that second round of deliberation, there are two possibilities. One is the ideal, and that is everyone is in agreement. You all, uh, you all agree uh, on the draft which is proposed by the chair. Um, sometimes uh, you, they are, there is dissent. You know, one of the arbitrators, normally it's, it could be both, uh, but normally it's one of the arbitrators feels that the solution is not just. And then there is uh, elements of trying to deliberate, to convince him, to make he makes papers, you make papers, and 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 sometimes he convinces you. Uh, sometimes uh, you convince him, 
And sometimes it's impossible uh, to find a, a, a common position. Well, then you, that's at the end, and then you say, well, you have the right to write a dissenting opinion. Um, uh, uh, the tribunal decides uh, this way and you write a dissenting opinion and you express uh, uh, your own uh, view. That's the normal way you, you do it. So two rounds of deliberation and a lot of drafting by the, by the president in between. Now, the, the idea of filing a dissenting vote, un voto particular, or a particular vote, I mean, is that a recent trend? Do you see that more often in the last few years? Um, how do you see the trajectory of the dissenting opinion in the world of investor state arbitration? Um, first of all, there are two types of dissenting opinions in good faith and in bad faith. In good faith is when there is really a, a point of disagreement. And there are often, I have once in my life dissented. I think it was a case in El Salvador. And uh, uh, I felt that justice was not being done, uh, that the decision was unjust to the state. But I could understand why my co-arbitrators um, had reached a different uh, solution because they thought that a previous award, which had been rendered by another tribunal, was already res judicata, and that we could not reopen uh, uh, the issues. And I thought that the issues that justice would be better served uh, if we reopen some issues and get to a, a solution which is more favorable. It's, I think, the only time in my life I have dissented. But I think it was, I could understand their position and they could understand my position. It was a good faith discussion on the effect of res judicata. And that happens, uh, that happens. It happens uh, that people uh, that on the same legal issue, you can have two uh, views. Unfortunately, this is not always the case. Uh. Sometimes dissents are made to sabotage uh, the arbitration, to prepare the ground for the annulment uh, of the award, to give reasons to the judge in the next instance, um, uh, which will help the judge to uh, annul uh, the award. And this disruptive type of uh, um, uh, dissenting opinions, they exist. Uh, I don't want to say that they are frequent. Uh, I would even say that they are becoming less and less frequent because it is the death, uh, the arbitration death for someone who does that because it destroys your reputation. But sometimes you have arbitrators for whom the relationship with the party which designated him or her is more important then they're standing in the arbitration community. They are one-off arbitrators. Which takes me to the next question. Do you also sit with uh, regularly in annulment committees? I did. I, I, I sat in a number of annulment committees while I was uh, on the exit list designated by Spain, which I am not any longer. I was there for two or three terms. And now they, Spain has, with good reason, chosen uh, younger, the younger generation. And in fact, it is my partner who is now sitting in the Spanish, Deva Villanua, is sitting on the Spanish list of uh, exit arbitrators. But yes, I did a number of annulment at exit. Professor, let me ask you a, a related question. The fact that there is no precedential rule in arbitration, the fact that precedents have no binding effect, the fact that other awards are persuasive, not binding, and there's no stare decisis in the world of arbitration, do you think that detract somehow from the legitimacy of 
the arbitral regime? I mean, how do you envision if, if at all, if this, a, this is a difficulty, a challenge, um, a defect? No, no, no. The it, it, regime? Rafael, no. Uh, uh, Professor Cox Alomar, no. Um, it, it, it is the nature of arbitration and it is the attractiveness of arbitration. Let, let me ask your, 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 your students. Um, uh, 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 commerce has multiplied by 20 times uh, in the last uh, 20 years, 15 times. I don't know the statistics. We could look them up. But the commerce is increasing dramatically. And that is good because that, is, that helps developing countries uh, to, uh, uh, to, 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 on their road towards uh, wealth. Uh, if trade multiplies, if investment multiplies, conflicts must uh, multiply proportionally. So there must be more and more commercial and investment disputes in the world. Now, uh, states have liberalized commerce, have liberalized investments. Have they created any institution, any court in the world to solve disputes? No. Is there an international commercial court? No. Is there an international investment court? No. Will there be uh, soon any commercial international court or international investment court? No. Why? Because to the states, arbitration has the huge advantage that it does not undermine their sovereign sovereignty. A state is if you create a court, the court is a standing organ, it becomes a source of political power, and it becomes a power vis-a-vis -vis the state. Think about the, the, the Supreme Court in the United States. Think about the European Court of Justice. Every court becomes a focus of power. If you create an international court, you create an international focus of power which undermines the sovereignty and the powers of the states. This is why states have, do not want to create international courts. And the more po powerful the state, the less it wants to create international courts. Arbitrators are one-off. You have them once, and if you dislike what the outcome, you will never, as a state, have them again. And they make one decision. It is for that case, it does not create a precedent. When you designate other arbitrators, they may come to another solution, which may be the opposite. See it from the point of view of the state. It is a, it is a solution because you need some sort of judicial mechanism to solve uh, disputes in commerce, uh, international commerce and international investment. But it is the, less, the least... Um, invasive of state powers. This is why we exist. This is why states prefer to submit a dispute to three uh, persons and not to some international judges. So uh, no, it is not, uh, it is not um, a detriment of arbitration that uh, I decide one thing, uh, Dean Celorio decides in the next case, the contrary, and Professor Cox Alomar in the third arbitration will decide something totally different. That is in the nature of the institution, and this is what precisely makes it attractive to states. Professor Fernandez Armesto, um, one of the more exciting elements I, I gather from your experience is the fact that as an international arbitrator, you sit on the crossroads of the civil law and the common law. Um, obviously, you have a Spanish-German background, um, doctorate in a civil law, doctorate of civil law. You have obviously practice in Spain, in the continent. Um, but as an international arbitrator, you are constantly dealing with, with the common law, with the Anglo-American law. And can you actually tell us a little bit about the clash of those two legal orders in international arbitration? 
Um, what has been your experience dealing with, for instance, document reviews and all sorts of Anglo-American legal uh, figures or legal constructs? Let me, let me tell you, huh? let me tell you how I see this. I think there is a, an area of very positive cross-fertilization. And there is another area in which I think there is a clash of cultures. The area of cross-fertilization uh, is procedure. I think in procedure, the common law system has evolved much better than the civil law system. Our systems, which come, and we could discuss where this comes from, and especially in the Portuguese and Spanish tradition, um, procedure was a very rigid, very, um, it was like a, 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 a straight jacket. Huh? Uh, and uh, it, uh, uh, the important, it, sometimes one has the feeling in, in our legal systems that the importance is that the procedure is complied with, not that the outcome is really just. And there, uh, I think we have a lot to learn huh, from um, common law in that I see that common law uh, procedure is much more flexible uh, and that the ultimate objective is that there is a, a, a just uh, result. And so I do see a, a lot of, a, a, in, in, if, if you look at procedure in arbitration, it is much closer uh, to common law procedure than to civil law procedure. It's much more flexible. Uh, you have document production for, for the good or the worse, but uh, you cannot withhold documents. Uh, it, it, it's an evolving system. You, uh, it, it, it is flexible. It, it is flexible and the ultimate aim is trying to find the truth and the truth lead, leading us to justice. Where I see the clash is in the concepts, in the merits. Because uh, Professor Cox Alomar, you are a civil lawyer. We work by concepts. We work by actions. I mean, if I sell you a horse and the horse is lame, I may have two or three actions. I can ask for resolving the, the, the contract. I can ask for a reduction of the price. I can ask for damages. But what I cannot ask is that you take the horse to, uh, um, to a veterinary, have it tested, and then you sell it in the New York market and with the proceeds. And we have, our system is a system of concepts, uh, actions, and uh, you cannot move outside the concepts and the actions. And sometimes I find that common law lawyers, yeah, they don't have that. They have, because they have this flexibility also goes into the merits, into the structure, into their brain structure. They have a, a fluid brain structure, while you and me, we have been taught from the very first day in law school that we must think in categories, in concepts. We must take the reality, put it into that concept, and then apply the, the, the actions which the law gives us to try to convert that into a legal outcome. And what I find is that with this flux in international commerce, you now see a lot of, um, a lot of common law uh, uh, lawyers taking on cases in civil law uh, jurisdictions and not really paying sufficient attention to the way civil law looks at the merits. And sometimes you end up in a situation where what is being requested may look to a common law lawyer reasonable and just, but which is totally incompatible with our system of concepts, actions, and, uh, and our legal structure. And if you accept that, you make justice, but you open your award for a challenge for being not based uh, on real civil law, but on a, on a fictitious creation 
um, by a common law uh, lawyer of a, a system of justice, uh, self-created. Professor, uh, in terms of the of the arbit of your colleagues, other international arbitrators with whom you regularly sit, do they tend to be more civil lawyers or common law, common law lawyers? No, I would say, I would think that they are half and half. Huh? But I don't think. But the 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 distinction is is eroding, huh? and good uh, common law lawyers then have a good grounding in civil law and understand how it works and vice versa. So to all your students, I would very much encourage them if they want to have a career in international law, to have two feet, two, two feet. one feet in, in, in common law, which is extremely helpful. And, the, and what uh, you teach them at the uh, uh, US, uh, um, uh, faculties regarding drafting, arguing, um, summarizing, uh, presenting the case, uh, telling a story. This is extraordinarily important. But then, if you really want to be a successful international lawyer, you must also do, do some research, do a doctoral thesis, do um, do a master's degree, uh, do something in a civil law environment and do understand how civil lawyers uh, um, uh, think and analyze the concepts, how they conceptualize uh, 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 the reality, how, um, because uh, uh, think, I mean, I, I know from the United States, uh, the whole world looks common law. Because of course the United States is huge, um, but it is not true. It is not true. It is huge areas of the world are civil law. Civil law is deeply ingrained in in in, in the way of thinking. It is deeply ingrained in how law is taught. And if you want to be successful in Brazil, or if you want to be successful in Cameroon, or if you want to be successful in China you have to have also this uh, background in, in civil law. Now, a close perusal of your more recent designations uh, shows that you have heard cases from the Middle East, you have heard cases from Europe, the Balkans, Latin America, Asia, very impressive. Um, but in terms of Latin America, how do you see investor state arbitration right now? How do you see the region right now in terms of its challenges and the types of cases coming from Latin America right now? Yes, let, let, let me say two words regarding investment arbitration in general. Um, investment arbitration only has, makes sense, uh, only has a place in the internet in the field of international relations if it helps countries to develop it is a tool of development it is a tool of development for countries which have a deficit of legal certainty seguridad jurídica and which uh, uh, to attract high quality investors have to offer a safety net of uh, uh, of international investment arbitration of international law. For these countries, uh, investment arbitration is a is 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 is, is a support uh, to their development because what it manages is to reduce the rate of return which an investor requests to invest in that country. I had this case, which is, I, I think it's very, let me tell you this case to your students, because it opened my eyes. It was a Andinia, a, a Latin American country. And it, it was one of these combined cycle uh, power plants, you know, a big animal where you put in gas and out comes electricity. And this is a really for, for, it's a big investment, it's a couple of hundred million dollars, um, but it is not a very sophisticated investment. I mean, there are hundreds of these uh, all over the world. 
And this uh, American investor had invested in these hundreds of millions of dollars in this um, uh, power plant uh, because there was a law uh, in that country which said, if you produce energy, it will be sold at this and, and this price. Huh? And um, before uh, even the power plant uh, started operating, there was a change of regime, a change of the law, and suddenly you uh, all these uh, uh, certainties, which legal certainties that, that you could uh, sell the power for a certain price that had disappeared. And then they showed to me, uh, the, this uh, uh, American investor, um, the, they wanted to prove the damage they had suffered. And they showed me uh, that in their internal, the board of directors had approved that investment on the condition that the rate of return would be uh, 24% in dollars. Now, that was an eye-opener to me. If you make the same power plant in New Zealand, the rate of return would be what? 7 6%? In Spain, 9%? In the United States, what? 5 6%? And suddenly in this country, it was 24%. And I said, if, if, if you want, if, if the investor wants to earn so much money, he has to sell the kilowatt at a very high price. So the kilowatt in this country, in Andinia, would be much higher than in New Zealand. And if you want to produce a shirt in Andinia, the, to produce a shirt, you have to use very expensive electricity. So you will be less competitive than in New Zealand or in the United States. And uh, you understand why poor people in Andinia, what they do is they cannot pay the electricity. They must steal the electricity from the grid, putting up these cables and stealing it from the grid because it is just simply too expensive. And the whole idea of investment arbitration is convincing an American investor who invests in Andinia that instead of charging 24%, well, he should not charge 6% like in the United States, but 12%. And if we manage that the investor charges 12%, then the cost of electricity in Andinia will go down and development in Andinia will pick up. Andinia will be a more uh, successful country, will produce cheaper shirts and will, be, uh, will have a better position in, 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 in the international market. And that's the whole idea of investment arbitration. And the problem, the problem with investment arbitration is that it is there to support countries, but there are certain elements which could be improved. It is, it is a system which could do with some improvement. And there is now a movement to improve it. The risk I see is that uh, in this process of improving it, it, it will be destroyed. It will be destroyed. That you will throw out the baby with the water out of the window and the whole system will be, uh, will be destroyed or will be uh, changed to make it uh, meaningless. Um, but that's up to the countries. I mean, I am just a very simple arbitrator. Apply whatever the treaty says and whatever the countries agree. If they think they, sh they, they should change the system, uh, it is their prerogative to do so. Professor, before we, we go on to the uh, last, last item on the agenda, hearing your advice, um, to our students in terms of how to become an arbitrator before we get there. The last question, the last substantive question I have for you is the following. I mean, there is a um, feeling in some quarters, in some quarters, that somehow investor state arbitration has a bias against state sovereigns. Um, but when one, for instance, reads um, some of your awards in Nova Scotia v. Venezuela, Anglo Adriatic v. Albania, one sees that sovereign states can also succeed and prevail and often win um, 
in this proceeding. So what do you tell folks who believe there is this bias against sovereign states in international arbitration? Um, well, I, I don't think I have any bias against uh, any state and I have uh, made uh, a number of decisions in favor of states. Um, before we start saying that there is a bias, one should think about the following. A lot of investment cases are expropriations where there is little doubt uh, that the investor had an, a company, an asset, a corporation, and that the state has taken it. So there the discussion is not has the state defaulted or not defaulted. There this, the discussion is only how much is the asset worth. So in that type of cases, it's almost impossible for the state to win 100% because it has taken the asset. And what, what is being discussed is how much should they pay? So uh, if they pay little, it is already a success uh, for the state. Um, I, I, I have a feeling that the biggest problems with investment arbitration comes not from developing countries. It comes from developed countries, Germany, uh, um, this type of countries, which have a long-standing uh, uh, legal tradition, have very well-functioning courts. The way international law is, is, is structured is that everything is bilateral. So you can have uh, a Peruvian investor suing a German, the German state uh, in investment arbitration. And that has created, especially I'm taking Germany because it's a very good example. Germany has had two cases, two investment cases against it. And it has created a lot of uh, negative uh, reaction in the legal community, in the German, in the very sophisticated legal and judicial community in, in Germany. Um, so the backlash against investment arbitration is, I think, basically from uh, developed countries. Uh, um, it is from the European Union. When the European Union says it, within the European Union, you don't need that. You have courts. You have a, a, a court system which works. Uh, so the, the, those, my feeling is those who support investment arbitration are those who need it those countries which needed, which needed to attract good capital. And those, maybe it is not necessary. Maybe if you have a treaty between Canada and the European Union, maybe you do not need investment arbitration. You have excellent courts in Canada. You have good, excellent courts in, in Europe, but other countries, other countries do need this straight jacket of international law to, 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 to give a, a, a surplus of, of certainty, of legal certainty to the investors. Imparting Professor um, Fernandez Armesto, international arbitration has, seen, has been seen um, since the end of the 19th century as a closed club, as a closed circle of folks who would accede to become arbitrators, but, but still it was a, a rather closed circle, European professors, um, initially, and all of a sudden, there has been an increase in, in arbitrators from other parts of the world, uh, women arbitrators, um, arbitrators from, from historically underrepresented backgrounds also acceding to the arbitration world, um, imparting what advice do you have um, for students who might want to become in future international arbitrators? Let me tell you. It is a privilege. I think it is the greatest privilege in the legal profession is to sit as an arbitrator. It is a huge privilege that uh, parties trust you. It's so amazing uh, that parties trust you to decide in, 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 in one shot, uh, because there is very little 
possibilities of appeal against uh, an award. It, it is such a privilege, such a responsibility. It's so much fun. It's so interesting. It's so challenging. And they even pay you. The amazing thing is I, I would do the job for free just because it's so interesting. And amazingly, they pay you and they pay you well. Eh? They pay you well. Uh, so to every young uh, uh, person, lawyer, who is studying now and says, I like the international law, I like international relationships, I want to work for a better world, I want that when I die, we have progressed a little bit towards a, a higher international justice, a, a more equal world. I, I, I want to, to add a little bit to that. Uh, the, to, uh, to end your career as an arbitrator is, uh, I would highly recommend that that is the aim of your career. And so the next question is, how can I do that? And I say, well, there are a couple of alternatives now. First of all is you need, of course, a good background. You need languages, you need Spanish, you need uh, English, you need uh, hopefully French, um, but Spanish, English, Portuguese is, uh, very, it's a huge asset. Portugal, uh, uh, Brazil, uh, the, the African Portuguese countries. Huh? Um, so first of all, you need good languages. Then you need a good education in common law and in civil law. Huh? And, uh, 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 um, and you, have, you have to have done things in different places and have moved around and uh, have seen um, academia from various uh, parts. Um, and then you have, I think, three, three, three possible uh, uh, ways. You can, the most standard way, eh? you go to a law firm and you become uh, an associate in uh, arbitration. In my times, it was possible first to be an associate uh, as I was in say commercial law or banking law, and then to move to arbitration. That is getting more and more difficult. And, and that is dangerous huh? because what I see is uh, arbitration lawyers who know everything about the procedure, the intricacies of arbitration, but know very little about business, about uh, realities, about banking, about guarantees, and uh, have no understanding of why things happen, have no grounding in, in finance, in economics, and that is not good. Huh? You should have uh, a grounding in economics and in finance, in, in, in bookkeeping and accounting, because that is important. Huh? So that is one uh, you, you then raise through, you work very, very hard, you earn a lot of money because they pay you very much, uh, but they also take out your soul and uh, uh, from you as a young associate, and then you become a partner. And when you eventually you then uh, you you make yourself uh, uh, well known in 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 our community, and then you uh, at some stage you leave your partnership and become an arbitrator. There are a number of cases. Which is this, I would say this has been the traditional way of doing things. Um, uh, the second way is you start working for one of the arbitration institutions. Right? So you go either to ICSID, to the ICC in Paris, to the maybe to the LCIA in London, or maybe to S to uh, Singapore, uh, to the Singapore Arbitration Center, and you start as a clerk, as a secretary in one of these arbitration centers. You, um, uh, you get to know a lot of people, you get to know how the system works, and at some stage you then jump ship, and uh, you then either start your own boutique as, a, as an arbitration lawyer, and you start doing also some arbitration, some work as arbitrator, and then you become eventually an arbitrator. There are also a number of people. Some people also jump from these institutions to a law firm. And then it's like a, 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 a side entrance into a law firm. The, the, are, the problem with ICSID ICC uh, is there are not too many vacancies. Uh, there are maybe 50, 60 vacancies a year. So it's a... Uh, it's a short uh, market. 
And the third alternative you have, and the third alternative you have is a new one. Eh? And that is the alternative of working as a clerk, as a secretary uh, with an arbitrator, and then working your way up through in the, as an adjudicator. So never becoming really a counsel uh, and then moving into arbitration, but starting with an arbitrator. That 10 years ago, I would have told you that third path does not exist. It does. Because now more and more arbitrators are now independent. Because more and more what is happening is that lawyers are lawyers and arbitrators are arbitrators. And so arbitrators need people to support them. There is no way in these new, uh, in these very complex arbitrations with hundreds of documents, hundreds of submissions, um, that uh, an arbitrator can do everything single-handedly. So you must, you need someone, a clerk to support you. And the profession of arbitration clerk, arbitration secretary is a profession which has risen in the last 10 years. But it is now a profession. And so there are uh, uh, young lawyers who start uh, as secretaries to arbitrators, sometimes with a fixed relationship, then they move out and they become self-employed uh, uh, clerks. And you now have at least two or three dozen uh, uh, persons I could name who are independent secretaries and they work for various arbitrators. And they also start working as independent arbitrator with smaller cases creating their network of people who know them, who trust them, and who actually then become arbitrators. The, the best example is, is, is Deva Villanueva, is my partner. She started as a clerk and she's now a very successful, um, and she's a very successful arbitrator on her own. I mean, she has her own cases. She has a number of exit cases. She has a number of commercial cases. And, but she has become, she has never been counsel. She has been always uh, 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 an arbitrator. And I would encourage, and that's my last words, Rafael. I would very much encourage women, not anymore, because women already are now on the bandwagon of, uh, uh, you now have more and more uh, women. And this is now an accepted, there is a pledge to include more women. Um, and, and women in, 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 in a few years time will be, at least uh, half of the arbitrators will be women, if, if not more. I would very much encourage, and that's where we really have a deficiency, is more people from countries uh, of the third world uh, or of uh, not not people who are uh, white from a first world country um, and uh, um, that type of uh, that uh, they will always exist but we need much more people say from Africa there are very very few African arbitrators we need much more people from Asia, from India, from uh, Brazil, from South America. Um, we have to have a much wider, uh, uh, um, much wider um, scope of integration of uh, arbitrators. So if any of your students uh, come from these backgrounds, I would very much encourage them to, to think about it because theirs is the future. It has been a great honor to, to have Professor Fernandez Armesto to hear his wise advice, his amazing experience. And I joined Dean Celorio in thanking him for his time, his generosity uh, in sharing his thoughts and reflections with us. Thank you so much, Professor Fernandez Armesto and, and Dean Celorio. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dean and uh, Professor. Cox Alomar, and uh, thank you for your students to listen in. I hope, I don't know, I don't know if this will be help, help them a lot, but we did the best. Huh? And that, thank you.
Thank you so much, Professor Fernandez Armesto, and thank you all who joined us today. And thank you so much also to Professor Cox Alomar. We did learn a tremendous deal today, and this is incredibly useful. And thank you for sharing your wisdom, your experience, and generosity with us. Okay. I hope mm -hmm. everybody has a good day. Thank you so much thank for you. connecting again. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Gracias.